Gathering only my essentials, I bolted out of the house, my feet pounding against the pavement as I navigated the bustling streets towards the train station. Breathless, I raced up the station stairs and onto the platform, anxiously awaiting the train bound for my hometown. As I stood there, attempting to quell my rising anxiety, I scanned the area nervously, half expecting someone to be tailing me, though I couldn't fathom the reason for my sudden flight. The decision to abandon the honeymoon I had eagerly anticipated bewildered me, replaced by this frantic escape. I found myself fleeing from the town, spurred on by the cryptic urging of my husband. My name is Megan, an office worker who recently turned 30. Despite feeling perpetually like an outsider, I unexpectedly found myself in a mentoring role, leading a hectic life. My fiancé, Bob, is my co-worker, three years my junior but exuding an air of maturity and reliability that often confuses others about our ages. He effortlessly balances household chores and garners respect from both superiors and subordinates. Bob seems like the epitome of an ideal partner, except for one troubling aspect. During a visit to my in-law's home, we were greeted by two women in the living room, their smiles reserved solely for Bob. My discomfort grew as they fawned over him, treating him like a cherished son. Catherine, a childhood friend of Bob's and neighbor to my in-laws, was particularly enthusiastic, bordering on possessive. Despite Bob's apparent disinterest in Catherine's advances, my unease persisted. Her persistence and lack of fidelity, evident in her history of pursuing men and relationships, left me unsettled. Though relieved that Bob didn't reciprocate Catherine's advances, my mother-in-law's alliance with her only intensified my sense of alienation. It seemed she was determined to oust me from Bob's life, using her closeness to Catherine as a weapon against me. I stand taller than her son, investing endless effort into my work, yet she seems oblivious to Catherine's true nature. She perceives Catherine, with her poised demeanor and initial facade of obedience, as a manageable and praiseworthy addition to the family. But due to those two women, our wedding unfolds into a nightmare scenario a month later. Astonishingly, Catherine, uninvited, graces the reception wearing a pure white dress, a privilege reserved solely for the bride. Though not as extravagant as a bridal gown, its color remains unchanged, and she becomes the focal point of attention in numerous ways. What's even more unsettling is her audacity to claim a seat at the family table beside my mother-in-law. Throughout the slideshow and our friend's speeches, her presence irks me as she engages in casual conversation with my mother-in-law. When they approach our table, my husband confronts them, struggling to contain his frustration. Catherine, you weren't invited, and you're wearing a white dress, seated at the family table. What on earth are you thinking? Mom, why are you allowing this? It's my child of friend's wedding. I couldn't miss it, and white suits my complexion best. Catherine retorts, while my mother-in-law enthusiastically endorses her choice, claiming she requested the seat due to an oversight in arrangements. Helpless against his mounting anger, my husband looks to his father, who wears a pained expression, evidently overshadowed by his wife's domineering nature. Despite our year-long anticipation for this day, frustration threatens to overwhelm me. Yet, I refuse to give them the satisfaction of seeing my tears. With a forced smile, I lift my gaze to Catherine, determined not to let her disrupt our special day. I observed a slight twitch at the corners of Catherine's eyes as I addressed her. How considerate of you to join the celebration, even without an invitation, Catherine. You truly are a thoughtful friend, aren't you? Her response was a grimace, countered by my remark about sharing her meal. My mother-in-law, sensing an opportunity to change outfits, swiftly interjected, Oh dear. It's almost time for me to change. Please step back. I'm terribly busy after all. I am the main event. With practiced calmness, the attendant by my side gracefully urged others to make way for the newlyweds, ensuring the smooth flow of the reception. Catherine shot me a momentary glare with eyes that seemed almost demonic, before masking her expression with a saccharine smile and departing. I refused to be a damsel in distress, thanks in part to the excellent service of the attendant and the rest of the staff. Despite my exhaustion, the reception proceeded smoothly, with genuine blessings from everyone except those two. Following our wedding, my husband and I decided not to immediately move in together, anticipating job transfers at the end of the fiscal year. We planned to meet for our honeymoon in Italy, 
departing from our respective homes to enjoy a romantic rendezvous. My excitement for our Italian getaway, my first overseas trip, was palpable. However, on the day of our honeymoon, as I nervously checked and rechecked my suitcase, my husband's frantic call shattered my anticipation. His urgent plea to cancel the honeymoon and return to my parents' home left me stunned and bewildered, with no explanation forthcoming. I stared at the phone, the abrupt disconnection leaving me bewildered. What could be happening? The frantic tone in my husband's voice had shattered my good mood, plunging me into a whirlpool of worry. Could he be involved in some sort of crime? The mere thought sent shivers down my spine. Forcing my trembling legs to move, I made the decision to heed my husband's instructions and return to my parents' home. Naturally, my arrival threw my parents into a panic. Their daughter, supposed to be off on her honeymoon, now stood before them with a pallid face. Witnessing my mother-in-law's disgraceful behavior at our wedding only heightened their concern. Despite my desire to explain the situation, I found myself at a loss. I didn't even know why I was there. Then, a call from an unknown number pierced through the tense atmosphere. Instinctively sensing something amiss, I answered, bracing myself for the worst. It was the police. With a much gentler tone than I anticipated, the officer explained the reason for their call. We received a report about two women causing a disturbance at your apartment door. We've taken them into custody. The older woman claims to be your mother. My heart skipped a beat. Me? Involved in a crime? As I listened, I realized I had left the call on speakerphone and my mother's bewildered shout echoed through the room. Even the police officer on the other end seemed surprised by the unexpected turn of events. I stood there, momentarily dumbfounded, before the realization hit me like a ton of bricks. The older woman the police mentioned, it had to be my mother-in-law and undoubtedly, Catherine was with her. But why were they here on the day of our honeymoon? I had a sinking feeling they were the cause of my husband's panic. Our flight had departed hours ago, yet here we were, robbed of our dream honeymoon in Italy. No Venice, no pizza, no pasta, no tiramisu. All the delights I had been eagerly anticipating. It felt like a cruel joke, one I was not inclined to forgive. Those people are complete strangers, I stated firmly to the police officer, with my mother seated beside me. Suddenly, my mother-in-law's voice pierced through the phone, shrill with indignation. The officer quickly ended the call, thanking me for my cooperation. It was clear they had concocted this absurd scheme to cause me harm. Hours passed and my husband finally arrived at my parents' house late into the night. As I suspected, it was indeed my mother-in-law and Catherine who had been detained by the police. They had discovered our plans to meet at the airport and hatched a plan to sabotage our honeymoon. Catherine intended to fabricate a story to my husband, claiming I had run off with another man, while my mother-in-law plotted to replace me on our trip. Their short-sightedness was astounding. Did they really believe they could seamlessly take my place at the last minute without consequences? But their sinister plan didn't end there. They had arranged for me to be taken to my mother-in-law's unemployed brother, a man I had never met. My husband's swift action, spurred by a call from his father, thwarted their nefarious plot. He arrived just in time to prevent further chaos. After sorting things out with the police, my husband apologized profusely for their actions and her ruined honeymoon. Exhausted from the day's events, he looked worn out, a stark reminder of the lengths he went to protect us from their madness. I couldn't bring myself to blame my husband, but my fury toward my mother-in-law and Catherine knew no bounds. Their actions were unforgivable, and I vowed never to forgive them, no matter what. From that day forward, I shifted from a defensive stance to an offensive one. Firstly, I sought compensation for the damages they had caused to my apartment door, which they had ruthlessly kicked and even battered with a fire extinguisher. The door, a recent high-end replacement, incurred significant repair costs. Additionally, I demanded reimbursement for various fees to the management company and the cancellation fees for our ruined honeymoon. The total sum amounted to nearly $20,000. Naturally, they resisted, attempting to shift the blame onto my husband. It's Bob who won't admit you loves me. All I wanted was your happiness, Bob, my mother-in-law retorted. But I remained resolute, threatening legal action if they refused to comply. If we go to court, we'll also expose your attempt to kidnap my wife. The cost claimed will only increase, I warned sternly. The mere mention of the word court sent tremors through my mother-in-law, while Catherine broke into tears. 
You forgive me, right? I'm your precious girl, aren't I? She pleaded desperately, but my husband's response was clear and cold. I'll never forgive you, he stated firmly, causing Catherine to let out a small shriek. But I love you so much. You love me too, don't you, Bob? She implored. There's no way I could love a woman who casually dates five guys at once or goes out with a married man, my husband retorted, stunning both my mother-in-law and Catherine into silence. I stood by my husband's side, reinforcing his stance. You claim to love Bob, but your declarations only surfaced after he and I became engaged. Isn't that right? I confronted Catherine, seeing through her facade. It seems your interest in a man peaks only when he's already committed to someone else. My mother-in-law shot Catherine a piercing glare, evidently striking a nerve. Panic flickered in Catherine's eyes before she pointed an accusatory finger. You're the main culprit. You tried to manipulate me because you didn't approve of your daughter-in-law. She accused, her voice tinged with desperation. The tension escalated as they exchanged heated words, their once amicable facade crumbling before us. It was a stark reminder of the fragility of their supposed friendship. Ultimately, intervention was necessary. Catherine's parents and my father-in-law stepped in, and it was decided to divide the claim amount evenly between both parties. Catherine's parents, oblivious to their daughter's disgraceful behavior, expressed sincere apologies. We enlisted legal aid, filing a restraining order against Catherine and my mother-in-law. Despite my mother-in-law's tearful refusal, their malicious intentions couldn't be overlooked, though their plan was thwarted neither received absolution for their actions. Neither my husband nor I harbored any intention of granting forgiveness. Three years later, as we enjoyed a tranquil life with our newborn child, an unexpected visitor arrived at our doorstep. Dressed immaculately in an expensive suit, the visitor introduced himself as Catherine's fiancé. He mentioned casually visiting Catherine's parents' house, sparking a conversation with one of her former classmates. Wasn't she supposed to steal Bob? the classmate had remarked. For the first time in a while, a shadow passed over my husband's face at the mention of Catherine's name. It seemed a classmate had attended our wedding and witnessed Catherine's disgraceful behavior. Initially, I brushed it off as a joke, but concern for Catherine's well-being gnawed at me. I'm sorry, but I had to investigate, my husband interjected. You and Catherine were childhood friends, but you're not dating now, are you? Of course not. We've never even dated. My husband replied firmly, visibly relieving Catherine's fiancé. However, he added with a hint of apprehension, but she might be dating someone else. The conversation took a sharp turn when my husband recounted Catherine's history of flings, including her infamous appearance at our wedding in a white dress. Catherine's fiancé staggered away, his composure shattered. Subsequent investigations revealed Catherine's extensive history of infidelity, much to the chagrin of her fiancé's prominent family. Her facade of chastity crumbled, leading to the termination of her engagement and legal action against her for damages. Poetic justice, indeed. My mother-in-law, fretting over missing out on meeting her first grandchild, watched from afar as my father-in-law cheerfully delivered baby supplies. It seemed Catherine's downfall had brought unexpected blessings into our lives. But I sent them back without even a glance. Catherine found herself abandoned by her fiancé and drowning in debt, while my mother-in-law yearned to see her beloved son and grandchild. Now, as neighbors, they engage in heated disputes at every encounter, much to the discomfort of those unfortunate enough to witness. Hey, Megan, how about we visit the Miami Seaquarium on the second day and head to Key West on the third? I've heard about the overseas highway, my husband suggested, trying to lift our spirits. That sounds beautiful. I'm also craving seafood at a Cuban restaurant, I replied, envisioning the adventure ahead. And I can't wait to swim with the fishies. As our son approaches his third birthday, we're planning a honeymoon we never had. Our destination, Florida, our main goal, to show our sun dolphins, of course, and to indulge in all the culinary delights the Sunshine State has to offer, especially Cuban cuisine. Italy may still be a dream on the horizon, but with my husband by my side, I know we can make it happen. After all, every day feels content and happy with him.